Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar Wednesday. We're so grateful that you're here to join us for this hour. We really appreciate it. Uh, today, I'm here with my colleague, Vitaly Lipschitz, who is an MCT, Microsoft Certified Trainer, and very deep into all things Azure data. So he really is the perfect person to be doing this webinar today. And we'll start in a moment. I just wanted everyone to know that this will be recorded. It will be up on our Accelerate YouTube channel. It will be on our site at accelerate.com slash library slash videos. And we'll also send you the URL after this is over. So you will definitely have it to refer back to if you like. And just to quickly tell you a little bit about Accelerate, my name is Anne. I've been with Accelerate for about 13 years, but we've been in business for a little bit over 20 years now. And we deliver a lot of training every year all over the US, worldwide, and of course, a lot of online training. Um, and other topics other than Azure that we teach include programming languages like .NET and Java. We teach a lot of data science like Python and R. Um, full suite of the, the Microsoft 365 uh, topics. Also RPA, AWS, DevOps, security. Um, so we teach a lot, but of course today it's all about Azure. And if you're interested in Azure training, you can look at our site at accelerate.com slash Microsoft dash Azure dash training. And you'll see a bunch of classes that we have up there. And we do deliver private customized training for teams, um, either live online or in person at your site. Um, but today we're here with my colleague Vitaly and he is amazing at all things Azure. He's a consultant with extensive deep real world experience that he brings into the classroom. So you probably won't stump him. Not that you should try, but you probably couldn't anyway. Um, he's also a Microsoft certified Azure associate and an MCT. So thankfully he teaches Accelerate Azure um, and AI courses. And um, he also teaches some Power BI classes and other Microsoft courses as well. Um, and so he is gonna go ahead and dazzle you with Azure. So I will go ahead and pass the torch to you, Vitaly. All, All right. right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, awesome. Just getting the um, getting the slide deck going here. All right, and I'm going to uh, share my screen. Okay. Uh, so you should be seeing my screen right now. If you can just uh, confirm on that, uh, can see the presentation. Yes, I can now. Perfect. All right. Wonderful. Uh, so yeah. So welcome to our webinar. Uh, looking forward to uh, sharing uh, what I know about the Azure uh, Data Platform. I've uh, been working with Azure uh, pretty much since it uh, originally came out. It was uh, originally called Windows Azure, and then it got uh, renamed to uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, usually just called Azure nowadays. And I've been working with the Microsoft uh, data stack for uh, more than two decades, starting with the SQL Server back in the day, SQL Server 7 and SQL Server 2000. So I've been uh, pretty deeply involved with the Microsoft uh, data platform even before uh, the cloud, even before Azure. All right, a couple of things we are going to uh, cover today. Uh, we did the uh, introductions, and uh, in the, during the presentation, we'll be talking about um, different types of workloads we'll be, we can run on Azure. Uh, so these are your uh, projects requ requirements essentially mapped to uh, what uh, you are running on top of the Azure cloud, the different types of workloads are suitable to for implementation with different Azure services so it really depends on what we are looking to do we'll look at through some common use cases and see how to map those use cases to specific azure uh, services which is that second item on our list here the next thing that we will be uh, doing is we'll be uh, talking about uh, architectures uh, so we'll talk about uh, different uh, ways to design our azure solutions we'll be looking at different diagrams uh, architecture diagrams, and these are called reference architectures, essentially recommended ways of doing things, uh, architectures that have been proven uh, both internally at Microsoft itself and also at a variety of uh, deployments in different uh, scenarios, different locations, different um, um, public sector versus private sector, different industry groups to uh, deploy those uh, solutions on top of the Azure Cloud Platform. Uh, and uh, throughout the course, we'll be covering various technologies. So we'll be looking at, uh, give or take, at least uh, 10 different Azure services, then they're all within this data domain 
uh, in Azure, and we'll talk about how to use those services to implement uh, what we want to do. Uh, throughout the uh, conversation today, uh, throughout the presentation, uh, please feel free to um, bring up any questions you may have. Uh, you have a questions uh, box on the side of your screen. You can just click there and type in the question. And as the questions are, are coming in, we'll just be answering them uh, uh, fairly, uh, you know, fairly synchronously, I guess you can say, with the, with the presentation. Uh, I have a second monitor here that I'm looking at for the questions as they're coming in. So we'll try to address them as quickly as possible and uh, give you that information that you're looking at. Uh, of course, it's a fairly short presentation, so we'll not be diving very deep into any of the questions, but uh, we'll give you at least a, a point or to point you in the right uh, direction there. And uh, the next thing we will do is we'll, we have uh, two polls that we have prepared just to learn more about the group and uh, see what uh, you already do uh, on top of Azure, if you're already using Azure, and uh, yeah, just kind of um, trying to make this uh, presentation as relevant to you as uh, as possible. Uh, so, uh, Anne, if you don't mind helping me with the, the first uh, poll, please, and starting that uh, first poll, uh, that would be great. Yeah, you got it. All right, let's go ahead and launch that. All right, hopefully you all should see it on your screen now. Just, yeah, we just really are curious to know what Azure data-related services you're using, and if you don't mind, checking all that apply. I hope that's not too personal. All right, wonderful. So I can see the results are coming in. Uh, quite a few are using Azure SQL database. We'll be talking quite a bit about that. Uh, and uh, let's see, okay, the, the numbers keep changing. So I was going to <laughs> yeah. mention the next number, but it's, it's already changed. Okay, uh, the, the, that's good. It means we're getting many responses. Uh, so Azure Databricks is quite popular as well. Uh, your end-to-end -end analytics platform, we'll be talking about that too. Uh, all right, and uh, many of you are using uh, file-based uh, storage for Azure Data Lakes, that's good. And uh, oh, the two thirds of you are using other platforms as well. Okay, that, that's interesting. Okay, so so quite a few. You can see quite a quite a big variety in uh, Azure deployments um, from uh, the group this week. So that that's great. Yeah, uh, all right. Ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about 80% voted. I don't think we're getting any more in. So I'll go ahead and close the poll and I can show it. Let's see if I can share. So now hopefully you all can see the results of our poll. Wonderful. So you can see uh, you can see quite a quite big variety there. And uh, uh, I'm sure many of you who have Azure deployments on the data side of things also use Azure for other things, maybe using it for application development or uh, Internet of Things, IoT, or like so many things you can deploy on top of Azure. Uh, so data is just a part of um, uh, a part of that uh, overall deployment. Okay, uh, sounds All right, good. Go ahead and take that off then. All right. All right, so I think we're back to your presentation then, great. All right, wonderful. So that's, uh, yeah, so that was the first poll. And uh, let's run through the second poll. We have uh, two polls all together. Okay, let's see. All right, yes, here we go. Yeah, what on-premise database, database platforms are you interested in migrating to Azure? Select all that apply. And they're coming in. <laughs> All right, very nice. So so far, it looks like uh, exactly half of you, or just no, just under half, uh, are migrating from SQL Server, which of course is Microsoft's uh, uh, number one uh, on-prem platform for relational databases. And then we have some uh, other commercial database platforms as number two, and then number three so far is uh, open source uh, the base databases. Okay, that, that that's good to know. So it looks like uh, yeah, most of you are running a Microsoft shop and you're basically taking that on-prem deployment and uh, putting it into the cloud and putting it into Azure. Yeah, and I don't see any, any more votes coming in, so I'll go ahead and close it and I'll just share so you can see. All right, wonderful. So yeah, we'll be using this as some of the examples, especially when we talk about the migration scenario in a couple of uh, couple of slides from now. Uh, okay, okay, wonderful. So that's uh, that's good. Uh, so let's uh, let's do it. Let's move to the next uh, slide. 
All right, so this is just a bit more detail about what we will be looking at. Um, for the workloads, which is the very next uh, section, we'll be talking about uh, two different types of workloads. The first type of a workload is a workload that's sometimes called uh, OLTP, Online Transaction Processing. And uh, that, that's your um, operational system. That's your system that's running uh, business day to day. And then the second type of workload, sometimes called uh, all up uh, online analytical processing, is your uh, business intelligence type of workload, is your reporting type of workload, which is a uh, which is a very different type of um, type of workload. We'll be talking about the distinctions a bit more in a few moments. For Azure services, we'll be talking about two main categories of services. One category is for relational data. So basically your tables tied together with what's known as primary key and foreign key relationships. And then the second type of data is non-relational data, uh, which is um, uh, could be uh, unstructured data in files or could even be multimedia uh, data like um, audio and the video and images and so on, and maybe even some so some documents that need to be uh, scanned from uh, from PDF files, for example. Uh, so all of those uh, types of data can be stored within uh, within Azure, within appropriate services in Azure. All right. Uh, and the, uh, the other thing we'll be doing here, we'll be talking about uh, benefits of Azure as the platform on which to deploy our uh, data services. There are quite a few. Uh, benefits that apply for across all the services, no matter what service we are deploying. So we'll, we'll spend some time uh, looking at that and, and just making sure that uh, everybody's comfortable with all those uh, benefits there. Uh, for projects, there are typically two ways to uh, break down the projects. There is uh, what's known as a greenfield project, which just means that you are developing everything from, from scratch, from the beginning. So you're going all the way from your uh, requirements to your technology architecture to your design without having to uh, to um, uh, migrate uh, uh, technology without having to um, follow any legacy type of um, uh, paths and, and so on. So you have a lot of freedom as to what to do because you're doing a brand new uh, system with the Greenfield projects. With data migrations, we already have the data sitting in an existing database. Um, for example, those SQL Server deployments that 40% uh, of you have, or those Oracle DB2 and other commercial vendors with 20% and 10% uh, from the group this week for open source. So you're taking all these existing databases and you are migrating them uh, to Azure, migrating them to those Azure uh, services. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about how to uh, best uh, select the services for those uh, requirements for those migrations or greenfield projects. And then there are three modern approaches to doing storage, especially in an analytical type of context where you're doing business intelligence, the reporting. And uh, these are the three ways that we list here. And we'll, we'll talk about each of these ways and the pros and cons of each approach towards the uh, end of our presentation. All right. Uh, okay, good. So let's uh, talk about, uh, and these are just some of the some of the technologies we'll be covering. Uh, we'll be covering more than just this. This is just a, this is just a, a, a small selection of um, of the main technologies. All right. So a couple of things about Azure. First, uh, I know some of you may already be familiar with Azure. Uh, some of you may be brand new to Azure. Uh, so uh, Azure is uh, Microsoft's. Um, public cloud platform. There are three leading public clouds today. There is uh, Azure, of course, for Microsoft. There is Amazon Web Services, AWS, and there is GCP, the Google Cloud platform uh, from, uh, from, from, from Google, of course. So these are the three leading vendors for uh, cloud computing uh, today. Uh, when it says public cloud, uh, public just means that um, any member of the public can become um, a, a customer. It doesn't mean that your data is public. Your data is still very much uh, private. It's as private as you need it to be. Uh, it just means that uh, you can become a customer just by uh, opening an Azure account and uh, uh, basically paying for the services that you're using. Uh, Azure was released about 12 years ago, give or take. Uh, and uh, today Azure is available in uh, more than 60 regions worldwide. Region in an Azure um, context means um, a collection of uh, data centers, uh, one to three data centers, uh, and uh, they are spread out around the world uh, in pretty much all the parts of the world nowadays are covered with at least one Azure region. 
this gives you low latency, it gives you fast response times, uh, and it gives you, uh, so these are the technical considerations, and on top of that, there are some also legal and compliance considerations such as data residency. Uh, so all of these considerations are um, allowed, they are all supported by the nature of having multiple regions, more than multiple, more than 60 regions around the world today. And in those 60 regions, we are running uh, more than 200 different uh, services. Services in this context just means types of uh, software. So, um, for example, Azure SQL Database is one service, Azure Databricks is another service. So, so if you add up all of these different uh, types of software, all of these different software packages in a way, you end up with more than 200 different services. So pretty much any any kind of uh, computing, any kind of storage, any type of workload we want to do, uh, we can run it nowadays on top of uh, the Azure cloud. And because there are so many services and we only have less than an hour, we are going to, to focus and our focus is going to be on the data portfolio. Uh, so uh, think about think of Azure as a place where you can uh, come up with, with, with you, you come there with your business requirements and you can build it on top of Azure. So no matter what it is you're looking to build, uh, Azure is uh, the place to do it, the place to implement it. All right, so in the context of workloads, there are uh, two main types of workloads. The transactional workload, this OLTP workload, is used for your operational system. So let's say you're running an e-commerce website, you have customers uh, placing orders through that website. Uh, what happens is through that website, uh, you will be able to, uh, your database for that website will be an OLTP type of website. And that website is designed for uh, for fairly heavy workloads th that are rep represented by a mix of read workload and write workloads, uh, sometimes called uh, transactions also. So, so as your customers are uh, putting in their orders, they are typically reading from the product catalog, they are writing to the orders table, they are writing to the order line item table, for example, um, Maybe they're entering their credit card information, so credit card details, address information. So it's a, this mix of reads and writes that defines transactions and defines this OLTP type of processing. Uh, so I'm sure you can think of many systems in your organization that are uh, that are that require this type of data support, that require this type of databases. And the second type of uh, database, the second type of workload, is this analytical workload and uh, sometimes it's also called OLAP workload. And this workload is designed for reporting. So this uh, type of a database is not being modified every second or every fraction of a second. It's typically modified through a batch load process, often just once a day or maybe uh, every couple of hours. And for the rest of the day, it's just utilized to read data to show that data in the report, in a, in a dashboard, in the business intelligence uh, product. So an example of that type of a workload will be an enterprise data warehouse uh, database, uh, sometimes called ETW. So those are the, uh, the two databases, uh, the two types of workloads. And now what we'll do is we'll look at the types of Azure services that support these uh, workloads. All right, so the first uh, uh, the first reference architecture will be for transactional workloads. And uh, what I would ask you to do is to focus your attention, please, on the uh, on this part of the picture, which is for uh, which is this uh, picture here. Uh, so, so sorry, uh, give me just a, one one second, please. Uh, so, so sorry. Okay. Um, so so this is the uh, database here, the Azure SQL database. The rest of this architecture is uh, the rest of the system, which includes applications, includes websites, includes other parts of the uh, solution. 
Okay, so uh, this Azure SQL database uh, is designed for this operational workload. So this is actually one of the most common Azure database uh, services. So we'll talk more about the service in uh, just a few moments. All right. Uh, a couple of other things I want to mention about this diagram. So uh, what happens here uh, in this diagram, we have this uh, operational website, which is this Azure data service uh, website. Uh, and uh, this website is typically communicating with the database through, um, through an intermediate tier, which is the uh, API uh, tier. So it's another website uh, that is between your front end that the customer is accessing and ultimately your relational uh, database. The other type of workload, which is this analytical workload, is used for reporting. And here you can see there are more data-related services. And the reason for that is there is typically more data processing. There is typically more um, heavy lifting involved of the data as the data is moving from the left-hand side of the diagram to the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have the original data sources and they can be uh, your organizational data sitting inside um, your own network they can be cloud um, uh, databases that also that your organization manages they can be external data services that uh, are uh, perhaps coming from your um, vendors from your suppliers uh, so any kind of data any kind of data can be ingested by uh, this uh, data pipeline. The second step in this data pipeline is all about data transformations, about converting data from one format to another, uh, cleansing data, merging data, uh, aggregating data, filtering it. There's typically a lot of transformation that's involved between the raw data services and uh, ultimately the, the reporting, which is on the right-hand side here. The service that we are typically using for this type of analytical workload to transform data is called an Azure Data Factory. And this service is used to uh, transform data. It's used for what's known as ETL, ELT pipelines. Uh, it stands for Extract, Transform and Load or Extract, Load and Transform in the case of ELT. And uh, this is... Um, a solution that is uh, highly visual. Uh, Microsoft calls it a low code solution, which means you can use a little bit of code, but typically you can uh, just do most things uh, with drag and drop, which is typically more productive and easier to maintain compared to writing a lot of, uh, a lot of code, for example, in SQL or Python or any of those other languages. Uh, so that's uh, that's our uh, main technology here. The other thing that's involved often in this architecture, and this is this is optional, you you don't necessarily have to use it, but often there are analysis services involved, and this is your uh, cube technology. Uh, this is a technology where uh, you have a special type of um, data source that's designed specifically for very fast reporting, very fast. Um, data aggregation. It's designed to hold some business calculations as well. So when your reports, which are typically done in Power BI in the Azure stack, when your Power BI uh, reports are going to retrieve the data, they connect to this uh, analysis services cube and that gives them that fast responsiveness and pre-built calculations and uh, uh, ease of uh, building the, the reports. Uh, so that's, that's very, very, uh, that's very, uh, uh, important component of this uh, pipeline. Uh, quite a few things here. Uh, as with all architectures we look at throughout this webinar, there are different uh, variations on this. Uh, you don't have to do it exactly the way it's here. It's just um, one way to do it. Uh, you can customize it to suit your scenarios. This is where it gets into into very interesting and very uh, uh, sometimes very um, challenging uh, types of analysis where you try to find the best solution for your specific uh, business and technical uh, requirements. Um, this is one of the most, uh, what we're looking at on screen right now, this is one of the most common ways to implement an analytical workload on Azure uh, today. Uh, two other pieces here that I want to expand on inside this box, which is all orchestrated, all driven by Data Factory. The first box here is 
um, Azure storage blobs, sometimes also called Azure storage accounts. This is where your files go. So typically, as the data is extracted from SQL databases and other data sources, it's typically extracted as files. They can be uh, CSV files, comma separated value files, <coughs> excuse me, or XML files or uh, JavaScript object notation files, JSON files. So all of these file types are stored in Azure storage accounts and Azure storage blobs. And the second platform, uh, and we'll talk more about it a bit later uh, within the next uh, half an hour, is this Azure Synapse, or sometimes called Azure Synapse Analytics, which is your end-to-end -end platform for analytics that can uh, ingest data from anywhere, transform it. It has built-in ways to store it in SQL and in an engine called Spark as well. So between SQL and Spark, it has multiple computing engines and multiple ways to, to store the data and ultimately present it to those cubes and reports. So quite a lot going on here. And uh, in the courses we run, we um, expand uh, on this diagram over the course of uh, several days, really. And uh, just over those uh, uh, three to four days, we uh, learn about each of these boxes. So this is a high level overview of, uh, of uh, how you can build those uh, analytical workload solutions on top of Azure. All right. Uh, so the next thing uh, that we will be looking at is um, the two types of uh, projects. So the first um, uh, type of a project is this Greenfield project where we have a brand new database. We have the freedom to select from the latest and greatest solutions because we don't have any legacy considerations that we need to uh, to follow and to try to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to um, uh, kind of keep uh, keep us building this uh, solution. There's no migration of any type that's needed for this Greenfield project. So they're, in some ways, they're, they're easier uh, to, to do. Uh, a lot of the time, we don't have this much freedom. A lot of the time, we have some uh, databases or even some, some code as well that we need to migrate. And what we need, we're doing there is we're taking our existing database that maybe is in our on-prem data center, maybe in a virtual machine, maybe running in Hyper-V virtual machine or VMware. And we want to take that database, let's say a SQL Server database, like many of you are SQL Server users, and uh, get it uh, into the cloud. And that's often a little bit um, trickier than Greenfield projects because we have to, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. Well, one of them is we have the whole um, consideration of data volume. Often we have a lot of data. How do we get it into the cloud quickly over the network? How do we keep the existing applications up and running? How do we minimize the amount of changes we want to make to our existing systems? How do we make sure the security is uh, at least as good as it was before? How do we make sure the performance is at least as good as it was before? Uh, so lots and lots of lots of considerations that we need to keep in mind for this legacy um for, for migrations because of the uh because the system is actively being used how do we minimize the amount of downtime as well as we do the migration so lots and lots of things to keep in mind a couple of different approaches we can use for migration one approach that we'll expand on in a few moments is called lift and shift just means taking things pretty much uh, as is so if you have a sql server uh today uh, that's running a workload, you can keep running SQL Server on, on Azure. You can just do what's called re-hosting. You can re-host your virtual machine with SQL Server from your on-premises data center to your Azure-based data center. This is the fastest way to get things running into the in the cloud in Azure. It also the, the downside is it doesn't benefit from all the Azure capabilities. We'll, we'll see what those capabilities are in a few moments. To benefit from more capabilities, uh, you can consider doing more of a re-architecture redevelopment and take advantage of some of the uh, more cutting edge, newer Azure services. Mm, you can also use a hybrid approach where first you do lift and shift. You get your database into Azure, and then phase two, you do a bit of uh, re-architecture, a bit of re-engineering, and start to benefit from additional Azure data capabilities. All right, so how do you actually get it done? So for the Greenfield projects, you would typically be using this Azure SQL database 
service. So, so what's the service all about? Well, the first thing to keep in mind about the services uh, in the category of services known as platform as a service, abbreviated PaaS. And these PaaS services are wonderful because they are fully managed by the Azure cloud. So we don't need to worry about things like backups. They back up themselves. The databases back up themselves on a particular schedule. They do uh, full backups, differential backups, uh, transaction log backups, all those things we know from SQL Server or other databases like Oracle DB2 and so on. Uh, all of those things are taken care of by the platform. And if uh, we ever have a disaster and we need to restore from that disaster through uh, database backups, uh, we know that the backups are going to be in place and ready to support that restore. High availability is also uh, supported by the platform. In, in fact, the SLA is very, very, uh, SLA just to define SLA is a service level agreement. So basically a guarantee that Microsoft provides to us as customers, a uh, very, very high level of guarantee, a very high uh, SLA uh, means the database will be uh, up and running 99.995% uh, of the time, very, very high, uh, more than sufficient for the vast majority of uh, systems we are running uh, on top of uh, databases today. And the other uh, wonderful benefit of uh, platform as a service is the fact that all the upgrades and patches are automated. So for example, if you are running SQL Server today uh, on premises, you know you need to, of course, upgrade it periodically to new versions when SQL Server 2022 comes out, you need to upgrade to 2022, or at least you need to consider upgrading to 2022. Uh, every month there are some security patches you need to install. If you're adding um, older versions, there are service packs as well you need to deploy. So all of that um, maintenance, um, it really adds up and it increases your, your costs of uh, running uh, the software in the cloud with Azure SQL database all those costs go pretty much to zero because the, the platform takes care of uh, uh, security patches and functional upgrades. So you're always running the latest and greatest software and it's fully patched for all the security, um, security um, uh, considerations. All right, uh, the, uh, along the same lines, uh, the security, uh, Microsoft has uh, thousands and thousands of uh, people who focus on security in the cloud, uh, they continuously um, review uh, from all, all angles, from a software side of things, from uh, the uh, security design of individual features, patch deployment, uh, network firewalls, encryption uh, of data when it's stored, encryption of data in transit uh, as it's moving over the network. So all of those things are, are taken care of as part of this multi-layer defense that's built into it. And a couple of other uh, features. Again, this is, we're just touching on things in a fairly high level. So that's um, that's a platform that we typically use for this uh, greenfield deployments. If you are doing a migration, you have two options. So for lift and shift type of a migration, you would typically just take your SQL Server if you are running SQL Server today, and you will just keep running it in a virtual machine. The only difference is your virtual machine is now running in Azure, and it's running as infrastructure as a service, which means you're still doing things like operating system upgrades, you're still doing security patches, you're still uh, uh, keeping an eye on, on, on things like uh, space use, for example, and uh, memory allocation, things that in platform as a service are all automated. So here we still uh, do that. The benefit, of course, is we can do the city hosting or lift and shift very quickly. And we also have access to the operating system, SQL Server, we can run it on um, Windows or Linux uh, today. So we have access to that underlying Windows or Linux operating system. We can install any software that we want because we still have the operating system um, behind it. So that's um, that's a good option for lift and shift migrations. If you want to, to do things in the platform as a service way and um, minimize the maintenance effort required for backups, for security patches, for all those things we talked about, there is another service called Managed Instance. And this Managed Instance service uh, is platform as a service, yet it's almost fully compatible with SQL Server. So you can fairly easily move from SQL Server to an Azure SQL Managed Instance, and your applications will just keep working. 
your users will stay happy using those applications, yet behind the scenes, uh, you're taking advantage of platform as a service. So a great option to keep in mind, Azure SQL Managed Instance, uh, sometimes abbreviated Azure SQL MI for uh, managed instance. All right, uh, I thought we'll do a quick demo here. It's literally a few minutes just to uh, give you a sense of how easy it is to uh, to actually do those things we talk about uh, in the slides here. Uh, so what I prepared, I'll show you, bring it to my main screen here. Uh, so what we have here is we have um, a set of databases in Azure. This is the Azure portal. So I'm logged into the Azure portal with one of my uh, demo accounts here. And uh, what I will do is I will create a new database. This will be an Azure SQL database. And uh, you will see within just a few minutes, we'll create a new database and we'll connect to it and we'll run some SQL queries on top of this database. Uh, and this end-to-end -end will be very quick because it's platform as a service. So we have the high productivity, uh, fully managed solution here. All right, so let's do it. So what we're going to do is we are going to come up with a database name. We'll just call it Azure Webinar for this database. Uh, we have a couple of uh, servers here that I'm running. I'll create this uh, particular service. Workload will be developed, lots and lots of options here. We are not going to go through all of these different options. Uh, for the database size, we'll just pick a very small uh, basic size here. So we'll pick, pick uh, the basic capacity, all right. And this is uh, just keep it the defaults, keep this a defaults, and keep this as defaults too. And what we'll do is we'll start with some sample data. Uh, if you worked with SQL Server before, you know there is a database called Adventure Works, which is just um, um, a sample e commerce database with some sample customers, products, and, and so on. So we'll use this sample data just so we can run some uh, interesting SQL queries. I'll go through this. You can see this database is very, very affordable, 627 uh, Canadian dollars per month. If you're in the United States, that's approximately uh, uh, five uh, US dollars. If you're in the European Union, I think that's around six euros right now. So so very, very, very affordable, about two, I suppose about two, two cups of coffee, give or take, <laughs> at least here in Canada. Uh, and that uh, gives you a basic database for the entire month. Uh, so great uh, value that we're getting. Once we're happy with the settings, we click uh, create and then the database goes to a provisioning queue where it sits for typically um, I think typically just a few minutes and once it's there we can uh, start using it so now you can see this deployment is in progress so behind the scenes in a particular azure data center that we picked uh, there is uh, an automated provisioning process that now goes and uh, allocates all the resources that this database needs. And uh, once the uh, provisions will be able to uh, create uh, to to connect, sorry, to connect uh, to this database and uh, run those SQL queries. And that's the type of process that we use for all those Azure services. You uh, decide on the service parameters, click next, 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 and then wait a few minutes, and then you have the uh, service ready to go and uh, ready to use. It's a very um, consistent type of user experience uh, that we get in Azure. You can see it's create, it's uh, connecting. Uh, you can go to the next slide. In the meantime, once it's creating, the thing is, uh, I, I know as soon as I go to the next slide, it will show me the message saying, yeah, I, "I finished creating," uh, but <laughs> I'll keep it keep it open in my second window. And uh, once it's done, I'll I'll show it to you uh, that we can connect to it. Okay, th there we go. J just like just like I promised, <laughs> as soon as I move it to my second window, it, it it's ready. All right, so let's go to this resource. And now you can see this is the fully featured database. Uh, it supports all the uh, transact uh, SQL commands that they used from SQL Server. And what we can do is we can just start uh, running SQL against this database. So I can connect to this database here. And uh, once it authenticates, we'll see all the tables. Give it a few moments. There we go. So these are all the tables that are within that database. 
So you can see some demo products, demo customers, and so on. And if I want to, to query this product table, I can just go here right through the web browser. I don't even need to install any special SQL tools. Uh, if I like things like Azure Data Studio application or uh, SQL Server Management Studio or any of the other SQL tools, of course, I can use them as well. Uh, but here I'm going through the web browser and you can see uh, I, I uh, looked up the first 1000 products from the product table and you can see these products are now shown on the screen. So in literally a few minutes, we created a fully featured database and we deployed it to Azure and now it's ready to use and I can start giving access to whoever I want. I can start creating tables, updating data, reading data, running reports of this uh, because now it's um, it, it's my database. I can, I can do anything I would like uh, with it. All right, uh, so that was a quick demo there. All right, uh, next. Okay, so often what we store in, data, in Azure, in addition to relational data, is we store uh, files. And we can store these files in a few different services. And the most common service in the context of data, uh, data type solutions rather than application development is called the data lake uh, or data lake storage gen 2 is the first, uh, the, full, the full name here, ADLS gen 2, lots and lots of abbreviations in Azure is just kind of the, the nature of this, uh, of the cloud. Uh, the, there are many, many services and uh, we try to keep the names fairly short. So ADLS Gen 2 is the name that you will uh, often see referenced in, in blogs and, uh, and, and so on. So this ADLS Gen 2 service allows you to store a practically unlimited number of files. The limits are in the petabytes, but even those limits are per account. So if you ever start storing petabytes of data, and you start running out of those limits, you can just create another storage account and it gives you a few more petabytes uh, for that. So practically unlimited storage, high security that you can apply, uh, very cost effective too, uh, compared to storing data just about anywhere else. And of course you have uh, backups on top of it, you have uh, replication for high availability, you have those uh, uh, 60 plus regions that all support the service. So that's a great way to store any kind of files that you're using for your data solutions in the Azure uh, cloud. The other type of data that we have on top of relational data and file type data uh, is called NoSQL. And NoSQL just means anything that's not uh, relational in nature, anything, any kind of, kind of you can say like non-traditional types of data. So we have some examples here. There will be uh, graph databases. Uh, graph databases are using this uh, funny look, look, looking Gremlin protocol. And using that Gremlin uh, protocol, we can store graphs that can be used for things like uh, social networks or to visualize uh, any kind of relationships between uh, different nodes in our data. We have um, column value databases. We have um, uh, the key uh, column, sorry, column family databases. We have key value database. We have very specialized types of databases that we can store. And all of this is supported within this Cosmos DB platform. Uh, there's actually a Microsoft course, which is a four, four or five day course, which is exclusively focused on this one slide, exclusively focused on Cosmos DB, if you're interested in this uh, platform. All right. And then we get the, the final thing that I would like to cover today is we get this uh, three different ways, three different architectures that we can use for our analytical solutions. And what we'll do next is we'll talk about these architectures at the high level on this slide. And then in the next three slides, I just zoomed in into each of these uh, different options. Uh, so we'll talk about them in more detail there. So uh, the first option is data warehouse. In a data warehouse option, this is the most traditional option. In this option, we have the data um, coming in and ultimately ending up in a relational database. We'll, we'll see the pros and cons of that in a moment. In a data lake option, which is uh, became popular uh, after the data warehousing, in the data lake scenario, we are storing most of the data 
as files and then we have some power users accessing the files directly and then we have some uh, business users go, still going through a data warehouse. So th this part is a bit more optional with the data lake, but certainly we have the, the data lake itself, which is uh, a collection of uh, organized uh, files, areas of files. And then the most modern approach where there is a lot of innovation right now in Azure and uh, other uh, uh, parts of um, uh, the industry is this lake house. And lake house is just a combination of data warehouse and data lake. And um, the premise for lake houses, we still have files. However, the files are accessed through this extra layer that makes the files easier to use, that adds some governance to it, adds some structure, and adds some capabilities that formerly required the data warehouse. So many organizations now are looking at lake houses. They are, uh, you can say, like a plan A type of uh, architecture, and often they uh, end up building data uh, data lake houses rather than data lakes or data warehouses. Okay, so how do we do a data warehouse approach on Azure? So this is the most, um, I would say the most traditional way to do it. We have our original data often coming from a transactional system, for example, from a SQL server on-premises database. We extract data from that on-premises SQL database into files, for example, into XML files or JSON files or CSV files. We store those files in an Azure storage account as uh, storage blobs. The storage blobs, you can think about them as just, just files, basically. So we store those files in Azure storage, and then we process them with this uh, Synapse Analytics platform. So we do ETL there, we do ELT, we transform the data, we maybe do some extra things, maybe some predictive modeling as well. Uh, all of that is done inside this box. And then we optionally build an analysis services cube, which is technically now for new deployments, part of the Power BI platform. So after we have our uh, data figured out, we can start running uh, reports typically using Power BI. <coughs> so that's um, the most common uh, reference architecture for a traditional type of data warehouse. There are lots of supporting services uh, behind the scenes. One of the supporting services is uh, Azure Active Directory, which is used for uh, security purposes. So authentication, authorization, um, device management as well. Um, all of those things are done through Azure uh, AD, Azure Active Directory. The second option for analytics is called a data lake. And the data lake, our data stays as, as files. So we typically uh, don't have a data warehouse with this. If we do, it's typically not covering all the data in all the files. It's just covering a small segment of the data. And then we point our workloads to this data lake. That's the whole premise of the data lake. And the data lake, one of the reasons data lake has been invented in a way is the traditional data warehouses tend to be fairly expensive, fairly time consuming to projects to uh, complete, uh, often going to multiple years. And before you complete the data warehouse, you cannot, with the traditional data warehouse architecture, you cannot really uh, extract value from your data. So you, you, you are there as a user waiting a few uh, months or a few years often for the data warehouse to be created. The data lakes were created uh, largely, invented largely to alleviate this downside. The premise of a data lake is you can just extract the data to a data lake, put it there, and right away you can start using it. Of course, the downside is it can be more um, challenging to use data from a data lake because it hasn't been uh, cleansed, it hasn't been transformed, it hasn't been aggregated, it hasn't been filtered. So often within a data lake, you have multiple areas, multiple zones like bronze, uh, silver, and gold, and different users point their systems to different zones. Uh, and uh, this way you have this trade-off between usability and uh, time to market uh, within your data lake. And these are some of the workloads that you can run on top of the data lake. And then the final type of uh, architecture which tries to combine the best of both worlds is this data lake house. This is one way we can do a data lake house today on top of, uh, of Azure. And these boxes here, these first three boxes, they are 
now available as part of Azure Synapse Analytics. So what we do is we provision Azure Synapse Analytics, and then once we provision this uh, service, once we provision the resource uh, for Azure Synapse Analytics, we can do this end-to-end -end processing where we have a data lake and a data lake through either the Spark engine or the C serverless SQL pool engine uh, or a brand new technology called uh, uh, Lake um, Databases uh, through the SQL Lake Database in, in Synapse Analytics provides this governance layer, provides this structure to our data lake. So when our users start to use the data in the data lake, instead of going directly to those files and trying to figure out how to uh, cleanse the data, how to merge the data, how to filter it, they go through this uh, easy to use presentation layer and then their reports are much um, faster and easier to create. Uh, so that, that that's a, a very, very interesting architecture that's now becoming uh, easier and easier to, uh, to build uh, thanks to Azure Synapse Analytics and thanks also to Azure uh, Databricks, which is a, um, a similar product for end-to-end -end analytics. Yeah, in this architecture, it also the, the other really nice thing about this architecture, it supports uh, our more um, advanced users, supports our power users, supports our machine learning engineers who maybe want to run some predictive modeling, and they can do that on top of the Spark engine, top of Apache Spark engine, which is also uh, supported by Azure, <coughs> excuse me, supported by Azure uh, Synapse Analytics. So you have a choice of two different computing engines on top of this uh, data lake house uh, architecture. All right, guys, so that's uh, all I personally have before passing uh, the uh, ball to uh, to Anne for some uh, closing comments there. So quite a, a fast tour of the platform. As you've seen, there is a lot of uh, in Azure, uh, even within this data portfolio, there are so many services that we looked at, so many architectures, so many possibilities. Uh, so you know, in a typical project, it ends up uh, really uh, uh, about, it ends up being a lot, around a lot of analysis. We look at the specific needs that uh, the organization has. We look at specific requirements, business requirements, technical requirements, and then we um, adapt one of the reference architectures. We adjust it based on uh, what that specific project requires, what your specific organization requires, and go from there. And uh, through the training that we offer, which Anne will talk about in a moment, uh, you will learn how to make those adjustments on your own, how to customize those reference architectures, how to review those pros and cons that we talked about in more depth to make sure that you have the right uh, solution for the workloads that you are running in Azure. All right, uh, Anne, so with your permission, I'll uh, pass it uh, back to you, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Vitaly. That was, that was wonderful. So I think you can, everyone can see why our clients all love when Vitaly comes out and teaches for them. Really appreciate that. Um, I'll go ahead and make myself the presenter and show my screen. So hopefully you can see the Accelerate site and the Azure training courses. Um, yes? Okay. Um, so you can, <laughs> perfect. Um, you can see we do have a lot of Azure training classes. The one, uh, the area that maps the best probably today is this Azure Data and AI training. So I'll just go ahead and go over there. You can see we've got a bunch of classes. And you know, the only thing better than spending one hour with Vitaly is to spend you know one to four days with him. Um, he teaches many of these Azure classes. I think the most popular here probably these last four. I know he does teach a lot of uh, the DP900, DP203. Those are Microsoft official classes. We didn't make up those, um, the prefix of the number. Those are actual Microsoft classes needing to be taught by a Microsoft uh, certified trainer, which of course Vitaly is. Um, and so if you click into any of these classes, you can see our overview of what you'll learn, the outline. Um, and one really great thing about these courses, it, it prepares you and your team for certification. So this class would map to the DP203 exam. Um, so this class would be really great prep for you and, and, and any of them, they all come with exam vouchers. Um, and yeah, and, and if uh, you, you can get Vitaly on a, on a phone call, he can kind of go through, he's really good at pinpointing to see what teams need and he can direct you to you know, whatever class you're going to need, you know, maybe the DP900 is 
more appropriate than the GP203. So he can really listen. He really listens and is also able to advise and then comes in and teaches the course. Um, okay, I'm just gonna just check just to see if we had any other questions, but no, I think we're good on that front and we will be sending out everyone a copy of this presentation. We have the video ready for you. Um, and as soon as I end this, which will we'll be in a moment, um, unless there's anything else, we have a little evaluation that will pop up and we really do read them and we take them to heart. So any, any feedback that you have, uh, if you're in need of any sort of training, you can let us know there. Um, and also if you have another idea for a webinar, we'd love to hear that. Um, people really wanted to see Azure data, so you know we did it. Uh, so if there's any other topics, any, any Microsoft or other topics you'd like to see, please let us know and um, your feedback is very much appreciated. We also really appreciate that you all that you all spent an hour with us here. We know you're busy, and um, thank you for being with us. And Vitaly, thanks again. That was wonderful. Um, all right, so I'll go ahead and uh, let you loose into the world, everyone. Thank you again so much, and have a wonderful Wednesday. Bye, everybody. Thanks thank again, you very much, Vitaly. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.